Uh, this community is a community that is primarily comprised of uh, Afro-Caribbean uh, descendants. They uh, refer to themselves ethnically as Belizean Creole, and they're descendants of um, freed uh, and enslaved African populations and uh, British settlers in the, in the region. Uh, the community, the earliest Creole inhabitants in the community, arrived in the area in the late 1700s, and uh, the earliest sort of village establishments were um, done by the Baptist Church in the region uh, around um, 1935, uh, and there was a formal village um, outpost. Uh, developed between 1843 and 1844, and the earliest schools, uh, or school, was developed around the same time and was associated with the Baptist Church. Uh, there were new reconstructions of um, schools or of school building in the late 1880s, and then in 1952, uh, the Belizean government developed uh, one of the first uh, Belizean government schools uh, in the country in Crooked Tree Village at a different location from the Baptist Church School. Research site, which is Instituto Pedagogico para Problemas del Lenguaje. And that's a very medicalized sounding name that translates to the, the Institute for Pedagogy for, pedagogy for um, students with language problems. And it's celebrating its 46th year in operation this year. But throughout those 46 years, um, the focus, the primary focus of the school has changed quite a bit. Um, during the year of my research, and currently, it's one of only three schools in Mexico City that uh, offers a bilingual model for education. So bilingual meaning um, sign language and Spanish, um, spoken and written Spanish. So unlike most institutions for deaf students, um, IPLIAP, which is the, the abbreviated name of the school, IPLIAP offers sign language instruction and prioritizes the National Sign Language of Mexico. And this is an extremely rare educational opportunity in Mexico. So as I said, in a city of somewhere around 25 million people, there are only three schools like that. And IPLIAP is the only, well, there are some caveats there, I want to say, but IPLIAP is the only nationally recognized primary school. So it's a pre-K through six um, sixth grade school, and the, um, all of this is to say that the, the options for deaf children to access education in the language that's most accessible to them is extremely limited, and this is one of the places that they can do that. In Kekchi Maya communities in southern Belize, formal education came in not too long after uh, the communities where I work have, were established, so uh, there's a community uh, called San Miguel, which I've done the majority of my in-depth ethnographic research in, and uh, the community itself was founded in uh, 1954, and uh, formal education came in associated with uh, Jesuits and the Roman Catholic Church not too long after that, and it's evolved and changed uh, quite a bit over the years. Uh, to date, there's still the original uh, school building was there, but it's expanded quite a lot. The role of formal education, according to parents, is really an opportunity for young people to train themselves to have the skills to get jobs. Another way that um, children learn about these kinds of um, examples of local flora, flora and fauna is that there is a small tourism um, industry in the village of Crooked Tree, um, primarily centered around uh, birds and the wildlife sanctuary. and um, Many uh, children accompany their older siblings um, on these on these tours when they're tourists in the community, um, and this is kind of even reinforced in school contexts that tourism is a possible uh, career opportunity for youth and. Um, so youth are encouraged to engage in conversation with um, with tourists. So they're both learning about um, the local values of these um, 
flora and fauna for consumption as well as um, value uh, in terms of promoting this to tourists. You young boys who graduate from primary school and go on to high school. And in fact, in 2013, there were only three boys from the community who graduated from high school. And there's only one male teacher in this school. And um, there's a great deal of concern about the future of those boys. And um, there was a lot of talk about the need for um, offering scholarships to help boys go off to high school and different kinds of incentives. Uh, and some of this is related to the fact that um, for many boys, financially, high school is not always an option, that uh, many of them will um, engage in some kind of physical labor or work on the farm or participate in farming or hunting to help um, contribute to their families. And in addition to that, there's some um, tensions between uh, boys' expectations and uh, their gender roles and um, what education is associated with. And so for many boys, when they turn the, the adolescent ages, they, it's harder for them to be engaged in education and they're very... Um, um, engaged in their uh, social identity and their uh, reputation and that it, being involved in school and church is not highly um, revered uh, on a social level and that's kind of um, associated with uh, other kinds of, of values and interests. And so this again kind of uh, brings up some major tensions between the community interests and expectations and um, and boys' own concerns and, uh, and gender roles. And what's interesting about the school in um, Crooked Tree Village is that although the majority of schools in Belize today have a uh, church government um, relationship, uh, the school in Crooked Tree is a, is a government school that is disconnected from the church. Uh, this school, however, um, although it receives most of its resources from uh, the Belizean government uh, uh, and students only have to pay very minor fees for things like books and uh, uniforms, uh, it also relies a great deal on resources from outside the country of Belize. Uh, for example, multiple buildings there have been constructed by the U.S. government and most recently the oldest school building was torn down in 2013 and a new school building was constructed uh, that houses four classrooms by the U.S. Uh, government. Um, so formal education has existed in the community for several hundreds of years and it is indeed required. Uh, education, uh, primary education is compulsory in the country of Belize for uh, individuals from the ages of 5 to 14. The National Secretary of Education in Mexico doesn't have a clear stance they basically haven't taken a stance on um, on lengua de señas mexicana. It's nationally, it's sorry, it's constitutionally recognized as part of the patria de México, the linguistic patria, but it's not. Um, there, there really, there isn't any language in the constitution nor in the language of the um, school policies to really make it accessible in all public schools. So deaf children do have the right to attend whatever public school that they want, but the content in those classrooms won't be accessible to them, or it'll be accessible to them only in, in limited degrees unless, there are, unless they have a sign language interpreter, or obviously if, unless the medical interventions work to, you know, work, work really well for them, but that's not guaranteed. The school in the village of Crooked Tree is rather centrally located. So the majority of children, um, although they may travel, um, will have to walk um, somewhere between um, 10 minutes and 30 minutes to school. However, the village of Crooked Tree is quite spread out 
And so there are some children that um, walk upwards of an hour or more to attend school. Um, and so this may be a very long trek. And for some children, depending on the time of year, they may be getting up before the sun uh, to uh, get to school every day. Um, in addition to that, uh, the village is, as I've mentioned previously in other questions, is an island surrounded by a series of lagoons. And uh, these lagoons are full um, f during about half of the year, and um, sometimes during the rainy season, uh, between the months of about April to um, November or December, uh, sometimes there's extensive flooding in the village. Um, and this makes transportation to school quite complicated. Offering sign language um, become attractive or uh, become important to families when they see that their young children aren't learning language and aren't communicating effectively. So kind of um, with, without... Uh, without losing sight of the fact that each of these families have a different experience and that each deaf child is an individual, there, there is a pattern that happens. Typically, these families, um, their first point of contact is with a medical professional or some branch of the medical community, and these kinds of interventions are, are um, offered to the family. The family sees that their child isn't learning Spanish the way that the family had hoped and that there isn't free-flowing communication between the hearing family and the deaf child. So either by chance or by, by searching out um, educational opportunities, they come to schools like, like Ipliat, or my participants ended up at this school. And um, of all the families that I interviewed, of all of my my family participants, either the most important resource that they mentioned when I asked them what they thought the most important resources were for families with deaf children, they either mentioned, um, the vast majority mentioned sign language as the most important resource in their opinion. And so that really speaks to um, why they're willing to make these sacrifices in order to bring their children to a school like Ipliat. In relation to the Maya villages in southern Belize, I'd like to address the phenomenon um, of high school attendance. While primary schools exist in most of the Maya villages, um, high schools exist outside of the villages, and children have to travel to attend high school. Now, high school attendance over the four years that I was um, conducting research in Belize was gradually increasing to the point at which um, my conversations with people um, involved this conundrum of high school attendance um, more and more as I talked with families about their concerns, about their livelihoods, um, about their hopes for their, their futures, for their children. Um, more and more high school um, was part of the conversation. Now, high school represents many different things. I suppose high school um, represents an opportunity um, for students to keep learning, an opportunity for them to leave their villages and learn the skills that they may need to get a job outside the village um, in one of the towns or in a different um, village in other parts of Belize. Without a high school education, um, there is not a possibility to become a teacher or to work in an office or those sorts of jobs that um, may be attractive to the children of the primarily subsistence farming um, families um, in the Maya villages in Belize. So this opportunity um, to attend high school is something that parents wanting the best for their children, are very keen to provide for their children, providing their children want it, and they achieve the grades, and they work for it. Ministry of Education in Belize has a great deal of control over not only what is um, 
taught curricularly in schools, but even the entire structure of schools. There are very strict rules about how many hours a week teachers spend on different subjects, uh, and teachers must post a schedule in the front of the room um, dictating this schedule throughout the week. Um, in addition to that, there is formal written curriculum for um, each of these subjects, for social studies, for uh, language arts, for mathematics and science, etc. Um, and teachers have copies of all of these curricular guidelines, um, and these are organized by uh, grade level um, and um, a set of uh, objectives and suggested lessons. Uh, and However, that said, uh, there aren't um, required textbooks for the teachers to use. Uh, teachers are allowed to choose which um, different kinds of books they would like to use to um, teach particular material to satisfy the curricular objectives, and um, there aren't a whole lot of, um, there are no specific social studies um, textbooks that um, are, for example, for grade um, standard five or something like that, but there are a series of books that have been written in parts of the Caribbean, um, as well as a few books specifically about the history of Belize, the environment of Belize, um, that most teachers, the geography of Belize, a small atlas for school, school children that most teachers um, require their students to purchase to um, address the curriculum. While I was at Tomoki in this unique school that's combining sort of a traditional high school curriculum and um, these Maya values, and when I was talking with some of the teachers there about this issue of high school attendance and the stress that it places on families to provide um, this monetary income um, for the students to attend high school, they pointed out a, a, an interesting irony um, that a lot of families um, are choosing to chop um, more of the, the high bush or the, um, the forest so they can plant additional crops, crops like rice. Um, in order to sell those crops to make a cash income to pay for school. So basically um, they're, they're chopping more of their forest um, in a way that is considered by some to be unsustainable in order to provide cash um, for students to go um, to school to learn skills that will take them out of the village um, and away from the forest. So fathers are, are having to do more work, more farm work, um, mothers are having to do more work in the processing of crops um, without the help of the labor of their high school students, but, um, but increasing their workload in order to provide um, those crops to sell for the cash income from their students. So the situation um, in terms of, of higher education is um, can be considered um, to be this this great stressor. In regards to the question of whether or not it is uh, valued, well it's kind of a, a complicated question which is probably uh, the response for most of these questions. Uh, yes indeed it is uh, formal education is valued, um, but in many ways the school is more important as a, a community center or community institution than for the kinds of information that students gather in the school. Um, for example, many important events are held at uh, the, on the school grounds. Teachers are considered some of the most um, important community leaders and advocates in the community, uh, so they serve on different kinds of political uh, political um, uh, committees and um, they are considered leaders because both they have a higher education than many of the community members but also um, because they can advocate for uh, resources. Uh, the way that schooling is done in Belize um, 
as a former British colony, uh, it's still very much a British structure um, and a rote learning kind of institution where students uh, memorize a series of um, facts and information per subject. And the structure is very strict. Uh, teachers have to spend a certain amount of hours uh, per day uh, and per week on specific subjects. Uh, the community members and um, families value education as a means to uh, passing the primary school education or primary school examination or the PSC and um, this determines students uh, possibilities for high school and uh, is seen as a way that students can acquire better jobs uh, outside of the school structure. teachers um, utilize a little bit of flexibility in terms of how they choose to teach um, different content and whether or not to utilize certain curricular um, materials. And so I'll give you an example. The African and Maya History Project was a project that was um, developed by the government of Belize by a series of um, intellectuals, Belizean um, intellectuals in history, anthropology, and archaeology to implement more uh, African and Maya civilization into the school context. Um, some national politicians, including the um, son of the former Prime Minister of Belize, Yasser Moussa, was also involved in this project as well. And a series of textbooks for um, upper level primary school, middle level primary school, and lower level primary school were written I, both for Maya um, civilization and African civilization. Uh, there were These materials were tested in uh, different contexts with teacher workshops in the summer and there were teachers involved in giving feedback to these texts um, and these were recommended in the curriculum, the social studies curriculum. However, in the communities where I work and primarily in, in Crooked Tree, teachers do not use these resources. Um, these textbooks were uh, first started in 2004 and implemented in the schools in 2005 and 2006 and to this day the majority of these textbooks sit on uh, shelves and are not taught. Teachers say that they don't have um, enough activities for them to implement them and that they've been teaching some aspect of African and Maya civilization since they started teaching. So that is one way in which teachers have some flexibility in choice um, of how to utilize curriculum. So I don't think you would see that kind of draconian punishment for speaking a first language in schools in rural southern Belize today. I feel that in general there's been a sea change in several different ways. One is that there are many many more Maya teachers in schools and Maya communities. So there has been a, a radical shift just in the, the personnel that is in schools and people who are in leadership positions. And I think that's made a real difference in the approaches that are taken in most schools in Southern Belize today. The other thing that has happened is uh, there's an activist group, the, um, a group of Maya teachers who have come together and share curriculum ideas and uh, concerns, teaching strategies, and I think that has gone a long way to empowering young teachers to feel like they can modify and uh, reshape the curriculum to fit what they see as their students' needs. For example, being very attentive to the fact that some kids are still learning English only when they come to formal school. So paying attention to the need for bilingual lessons and uh, discussions, especially with the very young kids something that, that's changed quite a lot over the last decade. This is all about restricted information. Every little bit, whether it's the families or, you know, the individual, but it's all about, you know, access to information. And that is not guaranteed in, in you know, in such an auditory world. The big thing for deaf people is that their, their information in a hearing world is really limited. Right. I mean, that's the theme that really came up over and over again that I recognized before, but not as well as I did after 
doing, have it spending this year in the field. You know, that's, that's the, maybe the most obvious point, but it's also the, really the most important point. I decided to make a distinction between um, formal education and informal education in um, a way that formal education, I'm not just defining as schooling, but um, institutions. So different kinds of ways that um, young people learn through um, institutions of some sort. So um, the, the first example is the Crooked Tree Government School, uh, which is uh, has a preschool as well as um, primary um, school grades from infant one to standard six, which is the equivalent of the U.S. Uh, system of kindergarten through um, grade seven. And um, so that's one formal education institution in the village, and all the teachers in that school come from the village of Crooked Tree, and all of the students also are from the village of Crooked Tree. Uh, another formal institution of uh, education and learning in the village is the, the Audubon Society, the Belize Audubon Society. Uh, the Belize Audubon Society has had a presence in the community since the 1970s. Uh, the village is actually an island that is surrounded by um, seasonally full lagoons and those lagoons are part of a protected wildlife area in which there are um, diverse flora and fauna, uh, one of the most famous um, pieces of that um, fauna is the Jabiru stork. Uh, and the Audubon Society has a small um, building at the front of the village and several um, in individuals from the community of Crooked Tree and just up the road from Crooked Tree are employed there to reinforce um, the hunting and fishing regulations in the area and protect the plants and animals. Um, and the, part of the reason that I consider it a educational institution is that um, certainly people are learning through those interactions with the Audubon, but in addition to that, in the last five years or so, the Audubon has developed programs for youth in the community. And this includes both um, visits to the school, um, events like a wetlands day, uh, as as well as after-school programs for young um, birding uh, children to learn more about um, the birds in the area. So just like everywhere around the world, kids in my communities in southern Belize learn really the majority of their life skills outside of school through informal means. And um, much of my research in this area has explored the ways kids learn about the non-human world through this process of informal learning. In other words, looking at how is it that kids come to uh, identify plants that are useful? How do they know what sacred landscapes are uh, associated with particular stories? In what ways do they find uh, the things that they need to make a living? First form of uh, informal education that I'll talk about is um, different kinds of skills and knowledge and values learned at home. Um, and uh, within the home context, uh, the way that the education and learning happens is very different from what happens in school. Uh, school is very much based on sort of rote learning, uh, memorization, a kind of banking model of education, whereas at home, um, young people learn from uh, really observing their um, elder peers. And this is usually through um, observing their siblings. To some extent, it may involve observing parents, aunts and uncles, and um, grandparents as well, but uh, what they learn from their siblings is particularly important and powerful. Uh, and um, there is to some extent a fair amount of gender differenti differentiation that goes on here where um, young girls often um, stay at home, help um, cook, um, but also take care of younger siblings and are quite involved in helping those younger siblings do things like uh, homework as well. Um, Although, to some extent, um, girls also will leave the home to participate in things like softball practice and playing outside. Um, 
And um, young boys are particularly involved in uh, hunting and uh, fishing. I, I also kind of consider sports a somewhat um, formal educational experience because there are um, several sporting um, teams. Uh, cricket is quite popular in the village, although youth do not participate in cricket. Um, basketball and softball, um, and to some extent, um, uh, soccer or football are, are popular and um, although all of those teams are run through um, the school uh, and children learn a great deal about sort of um, appropriate practices, socialization and expectations from their community and the nation state um, through their participation in those sporting activities um, also. Um, although this takes on quite a unique sort of um, community identity. Um, for example, the um, Crooked Tree girls softball team has won the national championship for um, three years out of the last five years. And um, this was both seen as particularly important for the reputation of um, the village um, as well as the school. And um, I was there for one year when the girls won the, the um, the championship and um, at the end of the final game the bus went through the entire village with screaming girls waving their hands out the window and um, waving flags as well. There are a variety of organizations from the United States that have connections with the village of Crooked Tree and they send um, uh, specifically churches, although there are also some um, colleges that have connections with the village and um, different um, mission groups will come down to the village in the summer and run vacation Bible schools, which are a rather formal educational context, as well as after school sports activities for children as well. Um, there are six villages in the Crooked, in the Crooked Tree Village. Um, this is um, a village of about a thousand people and these churches also have some uh, rather formal educational um, programs in terms of youth groups um, and then services on the weekends. And in the community of Crooked Tree, primary education for uh, both uh, adults and for many children is associated with um, children improving their lot in life um, to uh, getting jobs, uh, to successfully getting into high school. In fact, um, the entire last year of primary school is spent studying for the um, uh, primary school examination, and this is heavily emphasized in terms of what kind of um, high school a student will be able to get into. Uh, and uh, also, educate, primary education is associated in some ways to um, making contributions to the community and, and community development. And for some children, this may mean um, they're uh, leaving the co community, moving to the city, or even moving to the United States. And this kind of um, emphasis on uh, these issues and outcomes with education kind of raises some uh, major tensions between community needs and different forms of community knowledge and um, school practices. And so I'm going to talk about those in three different uh, contexts in relation to concerns about globalization, in relation to some gender issues, and in relation to language. Um, the first one, the globalization one, uh, as I mentioned, you know, there's this expectation that education may enable students to um, acquire jobs and improve their, their status, and um, for many it may mean leaving the community. Um, at the same time, there's a lot of concern about uh, youth contributing to the community, um, coming back and spending time participating in local politics, which there are very few young people who are interested in or engaged in local politics. And so this um, creates a kind of tension between um, what the community um, needs and, and would desire for the future of their youth and, um, and some of the reality of that situation. When I was visiting um, one of the high schools in the district um, in Belize, um, a high school called um, Tumokin Center of Learning, um, this is what we call perhaps an alternative high school, alternative in that it, it's uh, relatively new and 
Um, it incorporates um, aspects of traditional Maya practice um, and uses those aspects um, to teach life skills um, in addition to a regular high school curriculum, which includes math and English and those sorts of subjects. So, for example, Tumulkin will teach um, how to raise chickens or how to grow crops and then, um, you know, bottle your honey or make jam or those sorts of things um, to sell um, for profit. So it's using sort of traditional skills and valuing um, my agricultural skills, my values, those sorts of things, and kind of um, taking these traditions of the past and um, showing students their relevance for the future. And in the community of Crooked Tree, primary education for uh, both uh, adults and for many children is associated with um, children improving their lot in life, um, to uh, getting jobs, uh, to successfully getting into high school. In fact, um, the entire last year of primary school is spent studying for the um, uh, primary school examination, and this uh, is heavily emphasized in terms of what kind of um, high school student will be able to get into. Uh, and uh, also, education, primary education is associated in some ways to um, making contributions to the community and, and community development. And for some children, this may mean um, they're uh, leaving the community, moving to the city, or even moving to the United States. And this kind of um, emphasis on uh, these issues and outcomes with education kind of raises some uh, major tensions between community needs and different forms of community knowledge and um, school practices. And so I'm going to talk about those in three different uh, contexts in relation to concerns about globalization, in relation to some gender issues, and in relation to language. Um, the first one, the globalization one, uh, as I mentioned, you know, there's this expectation that education may enable students to um, acquire jobs jobs and improve their, their status, and um, for many it may mean leaving the community. Um, at the same time, there's a lot of concern about uh, youth contributing to the community, um, coming back and spending time participating in local politics, which there are very few young people who are interested in or engaged in local politics, and so this um, creates a kind of tension between um, what the community um, needs and, and would desire for the future of their youth and, um, and some of the reality of that situation.